Okay, great. It seems to everybody here. So um, I'm very pleased that we have uh, Johannes Nordstrom speaking to us now about asymptotically conical G2 solitons. Thank you very much for the invitation to talk. Uh, so this work is a uh, work in progress and it's uh, joined with Mark Haskins and also with Ron Juneman, who's an undergraduate summer project student, part financed by the collaboration, has also made an important contribution to this project. Uh, we also thank um, Alejandro Betancourt, who we had some discussions about with this, pro with about this project in the early stages. So for an introduction, so can you see all the way to the bottom of the slide? So I need to, maybe this is better. I can't quite uh, see the bottom. Yeah. Maybe now. Uh, I think now it might be okay. Okay, good. Um, so by G2 Soliton, I mean a self-similar solution to Brian's Laplacian flow for G2 structures for closed G2 structures. So there are examples of um, uh, G2 Soltons in the literature, um, but I don't really have time to survey that, but our project is defined as totally conical G2 solitons. Now, the, if you have a torsion-free G2 structure, then that doesn't move at all under the Laplacian flow. So that is, in a sense, a trivial static solution of, um, of the Laplacian flow. But what we want to do is we want to consider the problem. We want to try to find some non-trivial G2 solitons on some of the same spaces that admit um, Brian Salomon asymptotically conical uh, G2 manifolds. And we look for solitons that have also have a large degree of symmetry. So whenever I mention G2 solitons on lambda 2 plus of CP2, I mean ones that are invariant under natural SG3 action. When I talk about solitons on lambda 2 plus of S4, I mean ones invariant under natural SP2 action. So our main results is that we are able to find asymptotically conical G2 solitons of all three of the the type. So we can find expanding solitons and shrinking solitons and steady solitons. In the case of steady solitons, we, we can't, we, there are no, are no steady solitons on lambda 2 plus of S4, but on lambda 2 plus of CP2, we can find a one parameter family of steady solitons. So one point in this one parameter family is simply the Brian Salomon torsion free G2 manifold considered as a, as a trivial soliton but that admits a one parameter family of deformations to non-trivial solitons. The steady is it solitons- Do you understand that parameter, Johannes? Sorry? Is it easy to understand what that parameter means? Uh, no, I, don't, I can't really think of an, of an obvious geometric interpretation. I mean, you can parameterize this somehow how, how quickly something diverges from being the Brian Salomon uh, metric near the, near, the, near the zero section, something like that, but it isn't the most obvious. I don't off the top of my head have a good obvious geometric interpretation. So it's not something like the cohomology class, something like that. The but it, I mean, you something. can think of it as related to on these things, the torsion becomes asymptotically constant and it's some measure of how big that constant is. I see. Right. Thank yeah, you. Make them. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah. So the, the asymptotic cone for all these things is, is the, the same torsion free cone. We can also find, so shrinkers are finding shrinkers for these kinds of flows is kind of rare. Uh, they're, they're going to be more isolated, but we are able to find an explicit solution for the, for the shrinker equation, both on lambda, on lambda P plus of both S4 and CP2. So these kinds of sultans provide a model for how singularities can form if you run the Laplacian flow in a G2 structure. And the fact that we find any asymptotically conical steady solitons at all is kind of a new feature if you compare with Ricci flow. In the case of expanders, we, we've also found a one parameter family of, of complete expanders on both these spaces. And in the lambda two plus CP two case, we think that actually there's uh, that's probably part of a two parameter family of uh, expanders. So these solitons would instead be models for how if you start out with a uh, closed G two manifold, well, uh, a manifold with a closed G two structure with certain kinds of conical singularities, then the the passive flow could smooth those out. 
and again, this parameter is not just rescaling, right? This is some non-trivial. Yeah, so the, the, this is all up to scale. So when you when you talk about expanders, if you well, I, I will get to that in a moment. But there's there's sort of parameter lambda that tells you whether you're um, an expander or a steady or a shrinker. So in the case of expanders and shrinkers, if you fix that value of lambda, then that also fixes the scale. Right. And in, in the case of steady solitons, that's a one parameter family up to scale. Okay, so let me start with a brief review of uh, what the Laplacian flow is and uh, about solitons. So in Laplacian flow, you take a G2 structure and you push it in the direction of its Laplacian. Um, if you impose an initial condition, which is a closed G2 structure, then that condition is preserved for all time. So you, then the G2 structure will remain closed. And that also improves the analytic features of the flow. The stationary points of the flow will be exactly the torsion free G2 structure. So you can sort of hope that the Laplacian flow will push your G2 structure to a torsion free one. And that's also part of the motivation for studying the flow. Uh, so another reason to believe that that might have some chance of working is that you know that uh, the torsion free G2 structures are at critical points for the volume functional. And if you restrict the volume um, functional to a cohomology class, then the gradient flow of that will be the uh, precisely the Laplacian flow. Also, if you look at the effect of the flow on the induced metric, then if you're close to a torsion free G2 structure, then it does approximately the same thing as the Ricci flow. So that's also a hint that the flow might be nice. So uh, Bryant and Chu and Lote and Wei have established that um, you have sort of nice short term. Um, properties at least for this flow. You have short time existence and uniqueness. And also if you have a torsion free G2 structure, that's kind of, there's a fixed point for the flow, but it's also a stable fixed point. So if you move slightly away from a torsion free G2 structure, then you, the flow will push you to, back towards it. But long term, as usual, the long term behavior of the flow is much harder to understand. You expect that uh, the flow may, even if the flow is defined for short time, the, the solution might not exist for all time because you could have singularities forming in finite time. And an important problem is to understand self-similar solutions, solitons, because they would then serve as models for how um, the flow could be generated. So here is the equation that we want to solve. We want to find uh, GT structures which are closed and whose Laplacian is a linear combination of the three form itself and lead derivative. Because that condition is equivalent to having a solution to the Laplacian flow, which at all times is equivalent to the initial uh, G2 structure by diffeomorphisms and rescalings. The coefficient lambda of uh, the three form in the equation for the Laplacian of the three form uh, determines the nature of the solution. So if that coefficient lambda is positive, then you have an expanding solution. The solution just grows and it will then be defined for all time, forward time. If lambda is zero, then it's a steady solution. So it doesn't change its size and it's defined for all time. And if lambda is negative, then it's a shrinking solution. It will become singular in a finite time, but it will extend, will have existed for all backwards time. Let me also mention some fairly elementary observations about solitons. So one is that the, it's immediate from the soliton condition that if uh, lambda is non-zero, so if you have a non-steady soliton, then phi, the G23 form must be exact. So that kind of explains why when we look for, uh, when we look for asymptotically conical G2 solitons on the same spaces as the Brian-Salmon manifolds, then we prioritized lambda 2 plus of CP2 and S4 rather than the spinner bundle of S3, because on the spinner bundle of S3, the Brian Selman uh, G2 structure is uh, non exact. Also, if you have a compact manifold, then any soliton has to be either, it, can, it has to be an expander or it has to be a, a stationary steady soliton, so kind of a trivial soliton. So the only non trivial solitons on a compact manifold are expanders. So in that sense, it's kind of natural to also allow yourself to look at to look for non-compact solitons. 
And I also want to mention the scaling behavior that if you start with a closed G23 form that satisfies the, the soliton condition, then rescaling that three form gives you another soliton. But you also at the same, same time have to rescale the prime to lambda and the vector field x that um, determines how the soliton evolves. Okay, so we want to look for invariant G2 structures um, or G2 sultans, so sultans with a high degree of symmetry, because imposing a high degree of symmetry will reduce the partial differential equation to an ordered differential equation, which then becomes easier to solve. So the spaces we want to look at are the bundles of, of self-dual two forms on CP2 or S4. So each of those has a con natural congenic one action by SU3 or SP2, respectively. The zero section of the bundle is a, is a special orbit for this uh, action, uh, but all the other orbits are six dimensional. So the, either the uh, six dimensional flag manifold, SU3 divided by T2, by SU3 quotiented by maximal torus, or CP3 for the lambda two plus S4 case. The, so what we need to do is to say something about how you can describe G invariant G2 structures in these two spaces in terms of um, a few real valued functions. And the two cases look very similar. So in both cases, you can find a triple of closed two forms on the link on the, the principal orbit and a closed three form on the link such that any G invariant G2 structure on the link times R normalized so that the coordinate, the vector field in the R direction has norm one. You can write it uh, in terms of a triple of positive functions, F1, F2, F3. And if you want the G2 structure to be closed, then in addition, the derivative of the product of these three functions must be the half of the sum of the squares. The, the only difference between the two cases is that if you want to have an SP2 invariant G2 structure, then in addition, you have, need two of these two coordinate functions, two of these three coordinate functions to be equal. So you need F2 to be equal to F3. But apart from that, everything is the same in the two cases. So the, the structure equations, the exterior derivatives of these forms and so on are the same. So in pretty much all respects, the lambda two plus S4 case can be regarded as a special case of lambda two, the lambda two plus CP2 case. It's just that two of the three coefficient functions have to be equal to have any meaning in the lambda two plus S4 case. In other flows, it has been interesting to look at how, what the flow does to cones, uh, where sort of try, the flow tries to move the cone about or smooth it out, etc. In our context, the first step will be to understand what are the closed G invariant uh, conical G2 structures. So both for understanding that, but also for understanding the problem uh, or, understanding these uh, uh, G2 sultans more generally, it's helpful to understand, so separate the, to think about the invariant G2 structures in terms of the scale of the link and the shape or homothetic class of the link. So as the scale, you can basically take the volume of the link and then the shape of the link is then determined by some scale normalization of the, of the functions that determine the G2 structure. If you have a conical G2 structure, then obviously the shape of the link is just constant. But if you have a closed G2 structure, then actually the converse also holds. So if the, the shape of the link is constant and the G2 structure is closed, then the scale has to grow linearly. And then that means that your G2 structure is exactly conical. So the, um, then the three coefficient functions will be linear and the coefficients of um, uh, the coefficients, the linear coefficients then have to satisfy a certain cubic equation star here, which we can think of as the closed cone condition. This cubic equation is inhomogeneous. So if you start with any positive triple, then there's a unique way to rescale it to satisfy the closed cone condition. So that means that we're going to have a two prime to family of closed conical G2 structures on on the cone over the flag manifold. 
another way to think about this is that if you prescribe the, the shape of the link, then there's kind of a unique way to choose the cone angle to make sure the cone over that link be a closed G2 cone. The point about imposing this uh, G symmetry, have, if we have a symmetry group acting with cone 81 is to reduce the partial differential equation to an ordered differential equation. Because the Salton condition involves the Laplacian, uh, the most obvious way to write this ordered differential equation is that you get a second order ODE system for four variables. So three variables determining the G2 structure and one variable determining the vector field. But the condition that the G2 structure is closed means you also have some uh, dependence between the first derivatives of F1, F2, and F3. So you can actually rewrite this as a first order system in just five variables. So F1, F2, and F3, and then two additional variables that correspond to the torsion of the G2 structure. I obviously don't have time to say very much about the details of this system, but if you look at the scale normalized variables, so determining the shape of the link, then there's at least a tendency that if those are bounded as you evolve forwards in time, then they're going to converge in this sort of scale normalized picture to, uh, a, to something at a definite rate. And then the closed G2 cone, con the closed closure condition for the G2 structure forces you to the scale to grow approximately linearly so that you become asymptotic to a cone. So as you evolve forwards, either things go completely pear-shaped or you're going to be asymptotically conical. So it's, in that sense, it's reasonable to look for asymptotically conical solutions to these equations. So what was G again? Sorry, what was G? G, the, the symmetry group G was either SU3 or SP2, depending oh, on- Oh, I meant little g. Uh, little, little g was the scale. So this basically corresponding to the volume of yeah. the- Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. Thanks. So if you want to find these asymptotically conical solitons on these um, on the bundled uh, self-dual two forms on S4 or CP2, then one way that you can think about this problem is to try to divide into three parts. So first of all, the equations that I haven't written down, uh, this description of the invariant G2 structure is only valid on the principal part, on, away from the, from the special orbit given by the zero section. So one problem is you need to understand what solutions next to the, to the zero section. If you have something that's defined for small t, how does it have to behave as you approach t equals zero in order to find something that's smoothly across the special orbit? And once you've established what those sort of initial conditions are, then you try to understand how many solutions are there to that initial value problem. So how many at least local solutions near the special near, near the zero sections can be fine. Then you could try to look separately at the problem at the other end. So if you prescribe one of these uh, closed cones, we know that we have two parameter family of closed cones, but if you prescribe one of those, can you find solutions defined for large T that give you uh, as, as asymptotically conical to that given cone? And if you can understand both of those problems, then you can try to ask, well, do they fit together to define a complete solution? Can you, do they match up so that you get uh, something that both extends smoothly across the special orbit, but also has asymptotically conical um, asymptotics? Maybe that strategy isn't exactly how you want to formulate a proof, but it's, it's still useful to consider these questions. And the problem for the first part is the clearest one. So if you want to find solutions near the zero section, if you want to find solutions near the special orbit, then you can follow familiar pattern established in work of Eschenberg and Wang. Um, so first you identify the conditions on uh, these coefficient functions defining the invariant G2 structure. The, you identify the conditions that make sure that this extends to a smooth G2 structure on the zero section. And those conditions then give you uh, some kind of singular initial value problem and that you can try to solve by power series. And in this case, in, in this particular problem, that um, power series approach works pretty well. 
So what we can say is that if you fix the parameter lambda that appeared in the G2 Salton equation, the parameter that determines whether you have an expander, a steady soliton, or a shrinker, then for each value of that parameter lambda, you can find a two parameter family of solutions that are defined for small t that behave in the right way that they extend to uh, a soliton on the neighborhood of zero section in lambda two plus of CP2. Uh, so the two parameters are, here are called M and C. So the parameter M corresponds to the volume of the, uh, of the zero section. And the parameter C encodes how quickly the two functions F2 and F3 diverge. So in particular, if C is, the parameter C is equal to zero, then F2 is equal to F3, and then you get so you get a one parameter sum family that also defines solitons on lambda two plus of S4. You could think that this means that you have a three parameter family of solutions, so the three parameters lambda, M, and C, but you should take into account that, you should take into account the effect of scaling. So really up to scaling, you only have two scale invariant parameters. And in this two parameter family of things up to scale, you have a two parameter subfamily of expanders, two parameter subfamily of shrinkers, and one parameter family of steady solitons. You've got about uh, three and a half minutes. Uh, okay. Mm, oh, just about it. So the picture is clear. It's, the next question is these local solutions, do they um, extend some, do they define something complete when you evolve forwards? That picture is clearest in the expander case, where at least if we restrict attention to the case where F2 is equal to F3, then any of these one parameter family of solutions gives you something complete. And the coefficients F1, F2, F3 are approximately linear as you evolve forwards. So that gives you a one parameter family of expanders, both on lambda 2 plus S4 and lambda 2 plus CP2, with some kind of weak asymptotically conical behavior. And we have a pretty clear idea that actually we, with a bit more work, we can prove that these solutions are genuinely asymptotically conical. And probably also that you get a one to one correspondence with, um, uh, with certain closed cones. So that the closed cone determines which expander you have. The asymptotic cone determines the expander. So basically, if you start with a torsion free cone on um, uh, the cone of CP3, and then there's one parameter family of closed deformations of that, and you push it in one of those directions, then you can have an expander coming out of it. Uh, Johannes, yeah. there's a question from Gonzalo in the chat. Um, okay, I... Can you read that? Or I can read yeah, that. maybe you can read it. Yeah, he says that, I understand for F2 not equal to F3, the resulting solution on lambda 2 plus S4 is not SP2 invariant, but does it st is it still well-defined there? On that no, no. It's just not meaningful. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't extend smoothly over the singular orbit, for instance, or anything. <laughs> right. Yeah, great. Okay. If you look at the lambda 2 plus CP2 case, then we have this two parameter family of initial solutions uh, near the zero section numerical. <clears throat> uh, looking at that numerically, suggests that not all of those extend something complete, but an open subfamily does. The fact that you have an open subfamily of things that um, define something as a conical is also reasonable because of the quality of behavior near the ends, which depends strongly on whether you're looking at expanders or shrinkers. So in the expander case, if you take any of these two parameter family of closed cones, then you can find a two parameter family of solutions that are asymptotically conical to that. So uh, you have, all you have a four parameter family of asymptotically conical end solutions. So the flow lines of those would then fill up an open subset of your five dimensional phase space because we have a first order ODE in five variables. So if you have an initial condition that leads to, when you evolve forward gives you an asymptotically conical end, then if you perturb the initial condition a little bit, you would still see an asymptotically conical end. So they're kind of stable. On the other hand, for shrinkers, then we find that for each closed cone, there's actually a unique solution, a unique asymptotic conical end solution. So that's more, much more rigid. 
So this rigidity in the shrinker case means that shrinkers are going to be much rarer than expanders. So in the four dimension, you have a five dimensional phase space with a, in that you have a four dimensional space of flow lines, found a two parameter subset of that that extends smoothly across the zero section and a two dimensional uh, thing that has gives rise to asymptotically conical behavior. So you would expect that they would then, if you, we would guess that they intersect transversely and that would tell you that you only have finitely many shrinkers as in partly conical shrinkers on lambda two plus of CP two. Um, but in fact, we can spot at least one explicit solution. So that's written down here. So it's just a, a very, very simple uh, expression. And you can just read off that that's an asymptotic conical soliton with uh, rate minus two. And it's asymptotic to some particular closed cone, which is some definite distance away from the torsion free cone. And finally, a few words about steady solitons. So they, here the equations look quite different from the, in, in the case when lambda is non-zero. So let's start with we, up to scale, we only have a one parameter family of solutions near the special orbit. If you restrict the tension to F2 equal to F3, then you have only one solution up to scale and that corresponds to the trivial solution coming from the torsion-free asymptotic conical GT manifold. So we can find no non-trivial steady solitons on lambda 2 plus of S4. But on lambda 2 plus of CP2, then we can in fact find at least a, you know, a one parameter family of solutions. So basically in the steady case, we, before I talked about separating the analysis into looking at the scale and some scale normalized variables. In the steady case, the equations for the scale and the scale normalized variables basically decouple. Um, so you can look at the sort of scale renormalized flow of four variables. The unique fixed point of that is the torsion free cone and it's kind of stable. So that means that if you start with the initial condition that leads to the trivial brand Salomon uh, stationary soliton, then if that can be the, the initial condition can be termed in a one parameter family. And because the end behavior is stable, you actually then get a one parameter family of steady solitons. So I guess uh, this will be a good place for me to stop. That's great, Hans. Uh, let's thank him. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Do, uh, there's already been some questions, but uh, are there some more questions for you, Hans? Um, I can see Miriam waving, but I can't hear you. Yeah, I have a sort of natural question, of course, right? Uh, once you apply it to AC spaces, right? The study of the solitons you want to ask uh, about ALC spaces. And what kind of problems do you foresee there in applying the idea of solitons there? Um, yeah, I can't say I've thought about that uh, much yet. I mean, I um, yeah, I ha haven't even gone to the to the basic motions of trying to understand what would the what would the the end of such a soliton look like. Um, one one other answer would just be that um, you know, the motivation is, is to think about solitons that might arise as modeling finite time singularities of, of Laplacian flow. And so it's not clear that all kinds of solitons arise that way. And for instance, in, in Ricci flow, then as a result of Perelman's no local collapsing result, then there are quite strong restrictions on things like volume growth or there's this kappa non-collapse condition. And so we don't know exactly the same things in G2 flow, but it, it sort of suggests that things like the AC ones would be the first place to look at rather than something more collapsed like ALC. So that's sort of part of the thinking in this. Thanks. I see that maybe Dominic has a question. 
I can do. Um, is there any reason to believe that your shrinkers can occur as uh, kind of generic finite time singularities? So if you deform your uh, if you if you deform your um, G two manifold a little bit, will you still get a, a singularity with the same model? Sorry, I, I'm not. So you're saying if if I start with you mean if I start with a G two a closed G two structure with a conical singularity, yeah, and I deform well, no. it. No, no. If you start with a closed G two singularity G two structure without any singularities, okay, and you see a, a singularity forming right. okay. one of your shrinkers, okay, should that be a generic thing to happen? Okay, now I understand the question, but I have no idea about the answer. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Robert, did you have a question? No. no. Okay, uh, Simon Salmon has a question, which is, he says, can you say anything about the torsion? Is it generic in Gavin Ball's sense of uh, study of torsion? At least? I, I don't think we've thought about that. So for the SP2 invariant case, it would have to be non-generic because the isotropy group is too big to have the generic torsion. But um, my impression from what you were saying in the, about the possible limits for the constant torsion, you know, kind of possible values for the constant torsion in the limit, is that you probably sounds like you do get generic torsion for the uh, CP2 guess, CP3 guess. I think. Just a guess based on, on what you said. Oh. That would be interesting. Okay, well, how about we, uh, we say that, that we've closed the, the questions here and moving into discussion session. Let's uh, thank Johannes again, though. <laughs>